What's going on, everyone? Welcome to episode one of the Two Guys Watching Football podcast. My name is Cole Jackson. I'm your your co guy, co host, whatever you want to call me. Um, I'm here with my my co guy, co host uh, Michael Crawford at Abukari on Twitter. What's going on, MC? Nothing much, Cole. Nothing much. Can't complain. Uh, happy to be doing this first episode. Um, I'm I'm the Robin to your Batman. So <laughs> be here to uh, to play my role such as it is. And uh, I think we're going to have a good time tonight talking about some Ravens coaching hires, some new guys. We'll probably take a quick look at the, the overall coaching staff and get a feel for how much is has remained the same and how much it's changed. And then, you know, probably dive a little bit into some of the new guys and their backgrounds and, and what we think they might be able to bring to the staff. Yeah, basically what happened with this one is I, I think it was Wink Martindale talking in a in a press conference about uh, Rob Ryan and and the impact he's going to have on Queen and Harrison and the linebackers. And so I was like, you know, I, I've obviously thought about it, but I haven't really dove into it. And I was like, you know, what we, we brought in a lot of new coaches. So, like, who are these guys? What have they done in the past? And then, you know, you and I basically went down – wikipedia rabbit holes of research in these guys and it, it was fun because you see so many connections and like i don't know about you mike when you coach but i know when i coached like a, a lot of guys stick together and it's you know if, if if a coach goes on to do a different project a different team even at even at the community ball level you know they're reaching out to their contacts and that i think really kind of showcases itself in the nfl as well it's 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 just like every other business in the world it's a relationship business it's a, you build your network you keep those connections and i think that's a lot of what we're going to see tonight as we go through these guys yeah, it's absolutely a relationship business. You hear uh, players and coaches both talk about it being a fraternity. And, you know, when you have those relationships, there is a lot to be said for that familiarity, right, with each other. When you've worked together, when you know what the expectation is, you know how guys are going to teach certain things, you know how they're going to message certain things, you know the guys personally. You know who they are as human beings, their families, you know, what they stand for. So all of that plays into it. And, you know, if you had your pick between a coach who you had that relationship with and a coach who you didn't, all things being equal, right? Not not talking about other kind of qualifications or anything, but all things being equal, you're gonna take the you're gonna take that coach who you have that existing relationship with for all of those reasons. Absolutely. It's just like you become a manager in a new job and you're you're staffing up. You're looking for guys you've worked with. If, if it's a tiebreaker, why would you not bring in a guy that you're familiar with? And I mean, that relationship works with uh, kind of the player coach interaction, too. Like we're going to see with Keith Williams and T. Martin, like they have relationships as personal wide receiver coaches with a lot of guys across the league. And that's a reputation that they build. They carry with them. It's the same thing with like a, a Josh Harris and Lamar Jackson connection that the you know, they build that, that, that filters itself out. It gets you new connections. It builds, basically it builds yourself legitimacy. Right. So I think that's, uh, but you know, let, let's take a look right now. We'll, uh, we're going to throw up. So obviously in this graphic, um, white boxes with purple outline as our, as our new guys, I didn't put in some of the, uh, we added a couple of defensive assistants. I didn't put them in. Um, but you know, there's a couple of new guys there too, but starting at the, starting at the top, obviously nothing changing head coach, John Harbaugh back. Uh, you know, I think he's what 13th consecutive season since 2008. Uh, we have Greg Roman and Don Wink Martindale back. Uh, we have Chris Horton back. So our three main, three main coordinators are, are, are back in place. But uh, I think we'll start on, start on the offensive side of the ball. Uh, we brought in Keith Williams and T Martin that basically replaced David Cully uh, and his responsibilities last year. So uh, I know you deep dove them. So what, what can you tell me about Keith Williams? So he's one of those guys that fits into the category of not having a pre-existing relationship with John Harbaugh. And I think Harbaugh talked about that. He didn't have a direct relationship with him, but obviously he's familiar with uh, the work that he was doing in, in training um, some of the NFL's best receivers, knew that he had a coaching background, knew that he was a player. But yeah, um, as we, we get to know uh, Keith, a.k.a. Dub Williams, also known as at wideouts on Twitter for people who used to follow him there when he was really posting a lot of his training videos and stuff. He's got 18 years of coaching experience uh, that's spanning college and professional coaching. Um, I know some people who maybe read a little bit into his background say, wait a minute, I didn't know that he coached uh, professionally before. Actually coached in the AAF 
Uh, for the San Antonio Commanders, people may remember the uh, American Alliance of Football uh, ended in kind of a sad way with some financial issues and, and, and players having uh, to kind of scramble around and that kind of thing. But was interesting, going back to the relationship piece about that is the head coach of that team, um, Keith Williams was the wide receiver. Keith Williams, excuse me, was the wide receiver coach. Uh, the head coach was Mike Riley who Keith Williams coached for when he was at Nebraska as the wide receivers coach back in 2015 and 2017. So it's an example of those relationships right there. Um, but in terms of his college coaching experience, I just mentioned Nebraska. He was at Tulane for a couple of years, 2012, 2014. He was at Fresno State, San Jose City College, San Jose State. Interesting nugget about San Jose State. Uh, I think a lot of people know that Keith Williams trains Devontae Adams, uh, as well as Tyreek Hill and Sammy Watkins. Um, we know Devontae Adams plays for the Packers, but that's then at San Jose State. Keith Williams coached another former Green Bay Packer. He's been retired for a couple of years now, James Jones. Um, so there's another, another Green Bay Packer uh, connection right there and another wide receiver uh, who he developed and, and was able to uh, carve out a career in the pros. Um he had a playing career as well. I should mention that he played for the Washington football team. I think it was sort of a tryout situation during the off season, uh, played in the CFL for the Saskatchewan Rough Riders. And he also played in NFL Europe for the Frankfurt Galaxy. So uh, well-traveled guy in terms of a playing career. You could, you kind of get the sense as one of those guys who loved the game and was going to try to play it wherever he could get an opportunity to play it. Um, we talked a little bit about some of the wide receivers that he's coached. We mentioned, Devontae Adams, James Jones, um, Greg Ward, who people might know from the Philadelphia Eagles. He actually coached Greg Ward with the San Antonio Commanders in the AAF. So Ward had been drafted by the Eagles, and then I think he got released. And in that interim time, he ended up playing in the AAF and, you know, obviously put enough good things on tape there that the Eagles gave him another opportunity. And he actually saw the field I was quite a bit last year, for sure, maybe even in 2019. But um, you know, he's he's kind of become a part of their regular wide receiver rotation right now. A name that some Ravens fans may remember, uh, a guy he coached while he was at Tulane, Ryan Grant. Uh, he never Ravens was, legend. Uh, <laughs> he, he, he never never got on the field, never took a snap for the Ravens because of a failed physical. But he was a guy they tried to sign. I guess that was 2018. Was it that year? Maybe. Was yeah, year because they, I think it was before they ended up with. Uh, it was when Crabtree got released. So they, they Crabtree got released and then that medical fell through. And then we ended up with Crabtree. I think that was the sequence of events in 2018. They got yeah. him and John Brown and Willie Sneed in that off season. Yeah. I remember all three of those guys coming in. There's a lot of, a lot of excitement around that. Uh, so, you know, he has that connection there in terms of uh, coaching Ryan Grant at Tulane. And we've already mentioned the personal uh, wide receiver coaching that he's done and those players. So, What's interesting to me is something that you're going to hear this word a lot probably come up throughout this thing is the relationships that he has with these players, right? Working with them as their kind of personal wide receiver coach, personal trainer. Um, he brings all of that to the Raven staff. And you look at the guys, and it's a really young wide receiver room in general. I mean, most of those guys in there are all very young. I mean, you're talking about guys in their first, second, you know, maybe going into their third year, some guys going into their first years. And so he not only has coached NFL wide receivers as part of, you know, the training that he provided, but he also worked with college kids and high school kids. So, you know, he's intimately involved with guys throughout that developmental path. You know, he's not just getting these guys who are in the NFL and have been in the NFL for a couple of years. This is where he's been coaching. So obviously those guys are always trying to get better themselves, but they're closer to finished products than a high school player and a college player would be. So he's got that experience of working with guys throughout that spectrum and really working on fundamentals and development. And when I think you have a room uh, in terms of wide receivers that's as young as the Ravens room, that focus on fundamentals and technique is really important. Absolutely. And I think something that stands out for me is he's been working with Devontae Adams since he was at Fresno State, which was 2011. So he's, I mean, Adams has kind of stayed with him ever since. And Tyreek Hill's been working with him for a long time, too. And one of the things that I'm really interested in is we all know the long winded Marquise Brown, Tyreek Hill comparisons, but, it, you know, I don't want to d dive into the comparison, but it is important to me that he's worked with that type of skill set and unlocking some of that. Uh, I mean, that's the biggest thing with Brown, right? It's he's so damn fast and 
you know, working on uh, pairing that with some of his really solid route running, I think that's key. And that's something that we've seen Tyree Kill develop. Um, it's something that I think Marquise Brown can continue to develop. And I think he can kind of bring that, working with that that archetype of player. So I'm excited about that. And uh, of course, the connection with Sammy Watkins. I mean, he's been working with Watkins for a while and Raven signed Watkins. So I, I think that's really important because, you know, we've we've added a lot of talent to this, to this uh, wide receiver group. And there was a lot of talent sitting on the bench already. So I think it's going to be interesting because, Watkins now has two familiar faces. He, he performed under Greg Roman when he was in Buffalo. That was where he had his most success as an NFL wide receiver. And he's getting now his personal wide receiver coach that's coming in as the passing game specialist. And, and that's one thing I wanted to take a pause on was just Keith Williams is a very well-known wide receiver coach, but he was brought in as our passing game specialist. And I know a lot of people were like, whoa, does it not seem like T Martin and Keith Williams have a bit of a flipped uh role here so you know we can dive into that but maybe you could tell us a little bit about t martin and then we can talk about that you know the difference in the roles and how coaches kind of assign roles on teams so what can you tell me about t martin so t martin another guy with a lot of coaching experience 19 years uh of coaching experience like uh Keith Williams, he's held multiple positions. I probably should have mentioned some of the ones that Keith Williams have because people know he was a wide receivers coach in college, but he's also been a passing game coordinator in college at a couple of different places. So he's had that title as well. So where people say, well, wait a minute, where's that coming from? He's never done that. Actually, he has done it. Um, so like I said, T's 19 years of coaching experiences. He's been an offensive coordinator, passing game coordinator, a quarterback's coach and wide receivers coach. Um, Tennessee volunteer fans will probably never forget him because he was the quarterback when they won the national championship in 1988, uh, undefeated season, 13 and 0, and beat Florida State in the Fiesta Bowl, first championship in a minute. Uh, they had not won one since 1951. So, uh, like I said, people people who are volunteer fans will probably always be will have a they'll have a special place in their heart for T. Martin. And another little Ravens connection there, Jamal Lewis was his teammate uh, on that 1998 team uh, back in Tennessee in college. So. Uh, he also had a playing career like Keith Williams. He was actually drafted um, by the Steelers in 2000, played six seasons between the NFL and the CFL, a couple different teams in there, Steelers, Eagles, Raiders, uh, also an NFL Europe guy with the Ryan fire, also a CFL guy with the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. So they both had, obviously they were there at different times. They, their, their, their playing careers didn't overlap at all. I, I checked the dates on that because that was the first thing that came to my mind. Was, Wait a minute, these guys played. Of course it was. <laughs> um, but no, they, they just, again, another guy who seemed like, look, I'm going to play wherever I can get the opportunity, right? If it doesn't work out in the NFL, I'm not just going to you know hang up my cleats. I'm going to go wherever I think I can earn another opportunity. So you respect the grind. You always respect the, guy, uh, the grind when guys – you know, have that kind of passion for the game. In terms of his uh, college coaching experience, coached at Tennessee most recently, was there in 2019, 2020, his alma mater, coached at USC, and that's probably where a lot of the names, when we get into kind of notable wide receivers he's coached, a lot of those names will, will be familiar names from USC. Uh, coached at Kentucky, there'll be a familiar name there too, New Mexico and Morehouse College. Also coached at high school. So again, another guy who's worked not just at the pro ranks, not just at the college ranks, but down to the high school level at North Atlanta High School and North Cobb High School, both in the Atlanta area. Now, in terms of these notable wide receivers, this is, you know, kind of the USC name roll call here. Juju Smith-Schuster, Nelson Aguilar, Robert Woods. And I mentioned you probably know this Kentucky name, Randall Cobb from University of Kentucky, coach team why he was there. So, um, you know, he's he's got not only that extensive college coaching experience, but was also pretty much nationally renowned as one of the best recruiters in the country. You know, the USC is a national recruiting school, obviously being a being a power five school. Um, so he knows a lot of these players from the earliest days when they start going to these camps and stuff like that and developing relationships with these guys. So that's another thing that I think he can bring to the staff. And, and they you heard him talk about it a little bit after the draft, about maybe some of that information helping them because you know how much they love to get background information on guys. And, you know, T was obviously going to have some information that maybe even their scouts didn't have just because of his relationship uh, working at the Elite 11 QB camp and working at some of the other Nike camps 
uh, where all these players, the top players, you know, the, the, the four or five star recruits, three star recruits, where they all show up. So that's another kind of, uh, you know, additional benefit that I think he brings. People probably know by now his son, Amari Rogers, uh, former Clemson wide receiver. He was drafted in, in you know, the draft just a couple of weeks ago by the Green Bay Packers. There's another Packers tie in uh, third round pick by the Packers. And that's about it for what I have on T. Martin. And if you want to kind of dive into those titles now and those roles and kind of what we think about that, let's 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 do that. Yeah. So th- this is one of those things. And I mean, you kind of you, you hit on something when talking about not only Keith Williams having different roles throughout his career, but T. Martin having different roles throughout his career. O.C., passing game coordinator, QB coach, wide receiver coach. And and that's one of those things uh you know, when you've been coaching this long, you can really slide in in a lot of different spots, right? So what I what I really want to emphasize here, because this was a po- point of conversation when we signed them. And I remember people on Twitter being like, well, you know, it seems like they're in the wrong role. And it's, you know, obviously, I've never coached at the NFL level. I'm not going to, you know, make it sound like I've coached at a super high level. But most coaching staffs, uh, when, when they get together, um, the first thing before the season starts is they sit down and they do a good old fashioned roles and responsibilities section. And, and that's really where coaches put their heads together and talk about, you know, what can I bring? What can you bring? And it's, they, they, they literally sit down and assign roles and responsibilities, at least in my experience. And so that's definitely going to be happening here. So even though, uh, you know, the titles are what they are, but that doesn't mean that it comes with a generic set of roles and responsibilities. So I think that's really important to consider. Um, you know, T Martin can probably contribute a lot of stuff in, in terms of root concepts and, and that, and even though Keith Williams is the passing game coordinator, you know, it doesn't mean Martin won't feed in there. Uh, and it doesn't mean that they'll override Greg Roman in terms of what his scheme is. So it's, it's, it's all about how they determine uh, what those roles and responsibilities are. So I, th- I think that's important, but what stands out to me is we got two guys with 18 plus years experience. They've coached up and down. They've coached great wide receivers. Um, they've coached some good teams. They've, you know, they've played on some good teams. So I, I think it's, it's a heck of an addition of uh, positional coaches. So I, I'm very excited. I, I can't wait to see the type of impact that they can have. I'm interested to see um, with the additions at wide receiver, you know, what the passing game might look like. And, you know, we can do uh, our fun in terms of trying to determine, well, you know, was this something Keith Williams brought? Was this something that, you know, what did they do here? And it's going to create a different element of discussion, I think, this year. Absolutely. And I think one thing that, this kind of parallels to me in terms of, you know, titles and who's doing what and who's responsible for what it kind of parallels what you see on the field in terms of versatility, right? You can see that John Harbaugh and the staff, they value versatility. They value guys who can do multiple things, right? They always talk about the more you can do. And I think you see that paralleled in the coaching staff, not just with these hires. You look at guys who have been on the staff for a number of years. These guys have done a bunch of different things. I mean, just think about you take one guy like Bobby Ingram, right? Bobby Ingram was a wide receiver coach, then tight ends coach. Um, you know, you can bounce around to different guys. Look, I mean, you could go if you want to. You can go to Craig Versity, who's been with the team for 13 years. And he's held a bunch of different roles on the team. Same with Drew Wilkins. So I think sometimes you look at those titles and, and people – sort of get like laser focused on them, like really specifically when I think there's a lot of overlap sometimes. I mean, sure, certain guys probably major in certain things and minor in other things, but I think there's a lot of overlap. And I think that they really work closely together in, you know, on their sides of the ball and in sort of related um, groups. So if you have wide receiver room and you've got a passing game coordinator and a wide receiver coach, common sense would just tell you that those guys are probably going to work pretty closely together to make sure that they're coaching and teaching the same things and sending the same message so that everybody's on the same page and there isn't confusion out there. Yeah. And that's it. And I mean, you know, during, you know, if they're doing system install or something, you know, maybe it's Keith Williams pointing something out. Maybe it's T Martin pointing something out to, to the same wide receiver, but they're all working together under the same system, the same, like they set these. uh, I remember someone mentioned, you know, what if they're teaching two different things? Like, that, that's the type of stuff that coaches have to coordinate together to make sure they're on the same page. That's what goes into the process. So it's just not something I'm concerned about. Uh, I'm, I'm excited. We're adding two veteran guys. And just to give a shout out to the rest of the offensive coaching staff, we have James Urban returning as QB coach. 
uh, Versteeg, you mentioned back as running backs coach. We got Ingram at tight end coach. And then my guy, Joe D uh, uh, is the offensive line coach. And, you know, talking about CFL, uh, CFL tie-ins, Joe D is one of my guys. Cause not only was he in the CFL back in 1999, but he was right here in Ottawa with uh, what was then the Rough Riders. It, I think it was the Rough Riders. They're now the Red Blacks, but um, you know, he, he built a heck of a reputation in just one year in Ottawa. He, he worked a lot with youth coaches around here and a lot of guys, a lot of the older guys that I've coached with, they've spoken very highly of him. So give a shout out to coach Joe D because I, I love him. I loved his impact since he joined the team. And uh, you know, we'll, we'll flip now over to the defensive side of the ball. So as I mentioned, you know, Wink's back. Deceptive blitzes are back. The the fun is back. And uh, he's bringing back three guys under him, which is Chris Hewitt, who's doing uh, the secondary and the pass defense coordinator. And then Drew Wilkins is back as the outside linebackers coach. Oh, sorry, two guys, Chris Horton's special teams. So we also added three guys. So we got Anthony Weaver in as the defensive line coach, also taking over the run D coordination. We got the inside linebacker coach, Rob Ryan, which I can't wait to dive into Ryan. Um, and then we have Danton Lynn here as the DB coach. So, uh, you know, a lot to get through here. Maybe let's start actually with Rob Ryan, because I think we're going to be here for a little bit. So let's start with Rob Ryan, because I am so I could not be more excited to bring him in, uh, you know, we, 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 we just invested a first and a third round pick in, in Queen and Harrison. And I think we see flashes of what they can do and how good they can become. And I cannot think of a better scenario for two guys that are going to be taking on major roles in 2021 than getting a guy that's this season with experience. So MC, what can you tell me about Rob Ryan? Well, yeah, when a guy's got 31 years of coaching experience, <laughs> You're probably going to have to spend a little time on him, but I'll just start with the last name. I mean, people know the Ryan last name. Ravens fans know he's Rex's brother. Uh, they know the kind of swagger that Rex coached with. Rob coaches with a similar swagger, similar aggressive style. And the apple did not fall far from the tree with either guy because their dad, Buddy Ryan, legendary coach, um, defensive guy known for you know, kind of creating the 46 defense with the Bears and then obviously coach with the Eagles and some other places too. Very aggressive in terms of his mindset towards defense. And like I said, both of his sons uh, kind of have that same approach. So, uh, but to focus on Rob. So Rob, as you can imagine, over 31 years has done a little bit of everything. He's been a defensive coordinator. He's coached the D-line. He's coached outside backers. He's coached inside backers. He's coached defensive backs. He's coached on offense. He's coached running backs, wide receivers. He's even been an assistant head coach. Um, so he's 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 done a little bit of everything, as you might expect, uh, over that time period. And he's coached uh, for a bunch of different teams. Uh, for the Washington team, most recently in 2019, he was with the Bills in 2016, the Saints for a couple of years, the Cowboys, the Browns, the Raiders, the Patriots, where he won two Super Bowls, coached a couple of pretty good linebackers there at Willie McGinnis, uh, Teddy Bruschi. I think he even had a year with Mike Verbal. Uh, so pretty, pretty good linebackers there. Um, and he was also with the Arizona Cardinals. And this one kind of that, that was back in 94, 95. And that one kind of stood out to me because it was it was a year where he was coaching DBs. And the two years that he was there, this guy who some people may know because he was not too long ago inducted into the Hall of Fame, probably in the last five to six years. Aeneas Williams, uh, who had a Hall of Fame career, made two Pro Bowls while uh, while while Rob Ryan was defensive backs coach. You know, people can think whatever they think about the Pro Bowl. I'm right there with you. Uh, but just was interesting to me that he had an opportunity to coach a guy who, who went on to become a Hall of Famer and, and, and probably not the last guy. I mean, I, I think Willie McGinnis is in the Hall of Fame, too, right now. So uh, he's probably not the only guy there. He's also coached a bunch in college. Uh, Oklahoma, I mean, there's so many of these things, man. Oklahoma State, <laughs> Tennessee State, Hutchinson Community College, Ohio State and Western Kentucky. Um, so he's got that college experience there now here's another section that gets a little lengthy uh when you talk about some of the notable i focus mostly on linebackers but some of these guys are kind of in that edge role they weren't really edge didn't really exist as a term when when he was coaching some of these guys but they kind of are that stand up hybrid dn outside linebacker type some of these guys um oh before i do that that one note about aeneas williams i should mention um Led the league in that Arizona Cardinal secondary, led the league in interceptions with 32 and total takeaways with 42 in 1995. So, you know, it's something you're probably pretty, pretty proud of as the defensive backs coach uh, when you, you lead the league in those numbers. So anyway, 
back to some of these notable players. So we talked about Willie McGinnis, Brewski, Mike Vrabel, Roman Pfeiffer, also a Patriot, uh, with the Raiders, Napoleon Harris, Kirk Morrison. Interesting little nugget about that Raiders stop. So, because it's, it's funny to see how things come full circle. So in 2004, um, Rob Ryan was the defensive coordinator for the Raiders, and Wink Martindale was his inside linebacker coach. Well, now fast forward to 2021, Wink is the defensive coordinator, and Rob Ryan is going to be his inside linebackers coach. Um, it's so far so it's, away from each other, too. Like it's crazy how that flips. You know, we're not just talking a couple of years. Like we're, this is two decades later. Like it's yeah, it's just like wild. 17 years. <laughs> <laughs> like 17 years has passed. Um, now he's also out. Well, let me jump back into the players. I, I, I go off on all these connection tam, uh, tangents if you don't stop me. Um, so I was with the Raiders, uh, Napoleon Harris and Kirk Morrison uh, with the Browns to Quail Jackson uh, with the Cowboys. Some names people certainly will recognize Sean Lee, DeMarcus Ware, uh, even Anthony Spencer, uh, Cam Jordan while he was with the Saints, Junior Gallette, Curtis Lofton, David Hawthorne uh, with the Bills, Jerry Hughes. Uh, this, these Bills names probably a little too fresh. And some of our mind, uh, Jerry Hughes, uh, these guys weren't there uh, in the playoff game. Kyle Williams and Lorenzo Alexander and Marcel Darius. But we all know Jerry Hughes was there. Uh, and then with the Washington team in 2019, uh, one young and, and and really sort of up and coming linebacker and Cole Holcomb and John Bostic, a guy who's been around veteran linebacker, been on a couple different teams, but really solid uh, contributor. So the only other connection point I had we mentioned we mentioned the thing with uh, uh, with Wink and Rob Ryan, but uh, Rob Ryan also coached with Greg Roman in 2016 when he was on that Bills uh, staff. He was the assistant head coach uh, slash defensive coach. So got some existing connections, obviously with John uh, through his brother Rex, and then has some connections with Wink and with Greg Roman. So uh, it's like getting the band back together here a little bit with Rob Ryan. Yeah, I, I, I love that. I love going through that list of names that you have here. Like there, there are just some studs on here. One thing about John Bostic that stood out to me, uh, you know, he was a bit of a, he was kind of considered one of those old school guys where he would really just only be a thumper in this, this league. And I think that's something that, you know, I don't want to put him in a box, but that's kind of the role that they saw with Malik Harrison, I think was he could kind of be that. I know he has the ability to play some Sam and he could do some versatile things. And he actually held up pretty well in coverage uh, when he was at Ohio state. But I think that's where we see Malik Harrison sliding in. We saw that in the Tennessee game where, you know, he's just straight up fullbacking the, uh, fullbacking the the defensive front and so you know his ability uh, rob ryan's ability to get so much out of john bostic with uh you know a more limited but still that kind of similar traditional mike linebacker role um that that excites me about what he could do for malik harrison's game and how he could get malik harrison taking some steps forward to really uh, unlock that potential so that that was one thing that stood out to me because i remember when we were talking a couple of years ago about you know, Ravens free agents, we need a linebacker. And, you know, Boston kind of came up and I remember people being like, oh, he, he can't play. Like he, you know, he's going to be on for, you know, short yardage or just kind of play a thumper. But, you know, he's played, he played pretty well in Washington. So that, that was something that stood out to me. But I, I think the, the key question here is, do you think Jerry, do you think he's the one that taught Jerry Hughes how to, how to dissect that, that spider, uh, spider slide formation? To, to... <laughs> well, I'm sure he's seen a bunch of it uh, over his time, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I uh, I don't want to I don't want to go. We're not, we're not going down that road. It's painful. For, for, painful for context for everybody, so that uh, the play before the pick six in the Buffalo game, uh, there is that play where the Ravens run a slide protection to the left, and Jerry Hughes comes unblocked and disrupts the 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 the, the pass attempt to Hollywood Brown where he's wide open. So, uh, you know, one one thing you and I talked about when we watched that play was how well jerry hughes played it so you know you got to throw in jabs at yourself if you can't be self-deprecating what, what can you do so uh you know I, i'm excited about rob ryan i i'm i, I think it's going to be a heck of a fit I, I i don't think i could think of a better guy to come in and work with uh work with the two linebackers that we have uh, and not just the two like i mean we got we got lj ford and cj board here as well no disrespect to them but in terms of uh getting a veteran coach to come in and work with with two young guys that are just full of so much potential. I, I, I think it's going to be a really good fit for them. And uh, as we move down the line here, we got uh, two guys that actually came over from the Texans 
And so that was former Texans defensive coordinator, Anthony Weaver, who slides in as our defensive line coach and run D coordinator and the Texans defensive backs coach, which is Danton Lynn. And so Lynn coached under Weaver at Houston last year. Um, so, you know, I, 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 I actually deep dove, deep dove Lynn and you looked into Weaver. So why don't you tell me about Weaver and then I'll go through Lynn. All right. Another Ravens connection. People may remember that, uh, Anthony Weaver actually played for the Ravens. He was drafted in the second round of the 2002 draft out of Notre Dame. Um, I want to say he played 2002 to 2005. Yeah, that's what I've got in my notes uh, for the Ravens and also played a couple of seasons with the Texans. So there's his Texan uh, connection. Uh, like these other guys that we've mentioned, he's got multiple years of, college, of, of coaching experience, been coaching for uh, 11 years, has held multiple positions. Uh, most recently, he was, as you mentioned, he was defensive coordinator for the Texans. He's also been a D-line coach, assistant D-line coach, and a linebacker coach. Um, his pro coaching history, he co I was looking at this stuff, and I was like, man, I wonder if this guy has any overlap with Rob Ryan because Rob's coached for so long. But it was it was like just close, just close. So he did, he did coach for the Jets in 2012 under Rex Ryan. Um, is Rex Ryan was the DC that he played for while he was a Raven. So when Rex got the head job with the Jets and Anthony was done with his playing career, he uh, he hired him there uh, to coach the D coach and work with the D line. Uh, he also coached with the Bills in 2013, the Browns for two years, 2014, 2015, and then uh, we talked about his most recent time with the Texans. He had been there since 2016 up until last year. Also coached at a couple spots in, in college, North Texas in 2011, Florida in 2010. Uh, we talked about playing for uh, Rex Ryan in, in Baltimore, then getting hired up there in New York. A couple guys uh, of note that he's coached, uh, Muhammad Wilkerson played for the Jets. Oh, man, more bills. Here we go. Uh, Mario Williams, Kyle Williams, Jerry Hughes. There goes that man again. And Marcel Darius all with the bills. Uh, another Ravens tie-in, Paul Kruger. He got to coach Paul Kruger for a year when he was with the Browns. Uh, actually, when he had 11 sacks in 2014. So good sack yep. year for Paul Kruger there. Uh, got uh, a couple of years with J.J. Watt there. J.J. Watt, I think, was drafted back in 2011. And I want to say, uh, yeah, that's about right. Yeah, so he, he worked a couple of years with J.J. Watt, also with Whitney Merciless and Jadavion Clowney. Uh, so, you know, pretty pretty good group of guys there. And if you look at some of these stops that he had, the defenses and the defensive line uh, in, in particular had some pretty good years. Uh, when you look at that, that stand he had with the Bills, he had three guys that all had double-digit sacks that year. Mario Williams had 13, Kyle Williams had 10 and a half, Jerry Hughes had 10. Uh, it's a pretty good year there when you're, you're three of, of, of your four starting uh, defensive linemen have double digit sacks and another tie in. You know, I love my tie ins. Um, he played for Greg Madison when uh, Madison was the defensive coordinator at Notre Dame. Right. That's where we were played in college. And then Greg Madison has coached for both Harbaugh brothers. Uh, coach for coach with uh, John and the Ravens 2008 to 2010 and coached with Jim up in Michigan for 2015 to 2018. So again, there, there are those relationships and those connections showing up all over again. That was the thing that popped out to me. As soon as I looked through this, it, it was, I said, I, I don't even really remember him playing for the Ravens, but uh, um, I, I remember when I read Madison, I was like, Oh, pops Madison. There's the connection. So, uh, <laughs> you know, what, what stands out to me is the notable D lines that he coached. And I'm not just talking about, you know, one or two great players that he's coached. He coached, some damn good units like that when you're talking about that that mario williams kyle williams uh jerry hughes marcel darius line like that was a good defensive line when we're looking at mercelius clowny um watt in houston that's a damn good defensive line and he's gonna come here and he's gonna get to work with some studs and we you know what we really saw last year was uh I think it was a not the start that we kind of anticipated with uh, with the Monstars, Brandon Williams, uh, Derek Wolf, and Clayus Campbell, and then add in the junior Monstar, the up and coming Monstar, uh, Justin Matabike. But uh, that group was probably gelled more than any other unit uh, on the team throughout the year. And uh, like, look what they did to did to Derek Henry in the Tennessee playoff game. So you know he's going to get a chance to work with another very skilled unit. And, uh, you know, he's gotten a lot out of these guys. So I, I thought it was interesting, too, that he's also doing some of the run game coordinator stuff. I've never coached on a on a defensive staff, so I'm not entirely sure of, 
you know, what that would entail. And ter- but I'm assuming it's very similar to the offensive side of the ball. But, you know, that was that was one thing that kind of stood out looking through this is you don't always see coaching staffs that have all those specialist titles. And that's something that John Harbaugh has been doing here for a while. So, you know, I think he's big on uh, on the roles and responsibilities section. So I'm really looking forward to seeing the uh, the connection that, er- that Weaver can make with those guys and what he can do. Um, you know, I, I, I think it's going to be a really good fit. And then, you know, D- Danton Lynn. So he's coming in as the defensive backs coach as he comes over from Houston. And he is kind of off trend from some of these other guys. Like we're talking guys, 11, 18, 19, 31 years coaching experience. And then Danton Lynn is probably one of the most junior guys uh, on the coaching staff. You know, he's, he's just to do a little bit of background. So, uh, he's a former defensive back himself. He played his college football at Penn State. He came uh, came out of Salina, Texas as a four-star recruit. Uh, Penn State, he started three years at cornerback before going undrafted. And uh, he actually spent the 2012 preseason with the New York Jets, where he joined his father, Anthony Lynn, who we all know, uh, former Chargers head coach, now offensive coordinator of the Detroit Lions under Dan Campbell. Um and so that one's going to kind of come back again full circle. So let's just – so he 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 gets out of college, goes undrafted, spends the preseason with the Jets, gets released at the end of August. Uh, and, you know, I think it's pretty obvious his connection in there was through his dad. And uh, he actually came up and spent uh, a stint up in Canada with the Hamilton Tiger Cats before he took on coaching. And so he started – as probably the most junior you can start in the NFL as a coach. And that was as a uh, seasonal intern with the New York Jets in 2014, where he rejoined his father, uh, Anthony Lynn. So that 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 one really stood out to me uh, just because, you know, you and I talked about this a little bit last night. And, uh, you know, it, some people may look at that and be like, well, he's just kind of getting in because of, because of, you know, who his dad is and his dad's getting him that connection. And, you take advantage of the connections you can get in this world. And that goes for any profession. And I think what really stood out is that he's kind of forging his own path and he's really gone on to kind of make his own career. And he, he has had some, uh, um, you know, some, some really good stints. Uh, so he's, he's been with the, uh, he's been a defensive assistant with the bills and chargers before going to the Texans where he was two years as an assistant secondary coach before he became the primary DB coach in 2020. Uh, so the first two years he was under Romeo Cornell, uh, on those Texans defenses, he worked with some pretty good, uh, pretty good safeties and corners there. He's with Tyrone Matthew and Justin Reed at safety, Jonathan Joseph, Kareem Jackson, at cornerback in 2018. And then, uh, you know, Cornell moved on and Anthony Weaver, who we just talked about, took over as DC and he worked with Reed and Eric Murray last year and then had Vernon Hargraves and Bradley Roby. And so the thing I want to focus on here is if you go back and you look at the Houston Texans over the last few years and kind of what their league rank was and pass defense, uh, you know, you might not be very impressed. And so I think that's fair. I think that's something you need to consider when you're looking at a coaching performance, but don't let that fool you because I remember when we hired Wink Martindale to take on defensive coordinator and he had that stint as a Denver Broncos defensive coordinator. First thing I went and looked at was that. And he did not have good ranks, but then you look at the rosters he had, he didn't have very much to work with. Uh, I'm talking about Wink when, when he was with Denver, uh, you know, he had an aging defense. He didn't have a whole lot of studs and, you know, sometimes a coach can only get what he, you know, he can only work with what he's got. And so some of that is what's going on with that Texans defensive back group. So, you know, it was kind of one of those things where I, I think I had to check myself because I was like, oh, it's kind of like, oh, why are we hiring this guy? He's, you know, he's not producing, but, you know, you only work with what you got. So uh, that was one thing that uh, that stood out to me. I think it's very telling that Weaver brought him over. Weaver sees something in him. Uh, well, I shouldn't say Weaver brought him over, but I'm assuming as his defensive coordinator last year, he would have spoke very highly of Lynn um, enough so to kind of make that connection. So, you know, wh- what do you what do you think about Lynn? It's interesting that they're bringing in a guy who coached with um, their now defensive line coach, coached on the same defense. Uh, It's just not something that you see too, too often. It's probably happened before, but that really does stick out to me. But I like the fact that he's a younger guy, that he is still sort of growing and and, and learning, you know, that that coaching position. And like you said, and, and really this goes back to something Wink says all the time. Um, and I wonder if, if maybe it didn't it didn't originate from that year with the Denver Broncos where he says this game is and always will be about the players. 
He always gives credit to the players first. Obviously, coaches play an important role, but you know, you're teaching, you're developing. Uh, when you get to a coordinator position, you're calling defenses or calling plays on offense to try to put these guys in positions to be successful, right? To to do what they do well. But it all starts with the players, right? You can do all of those things as a coach, but if you don't have the the Jimmys and the Joes, sometimes the X's and O's don't matter. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, that that's just the reality. And, and, you know, I don't want that to come across as as excuse making. And those guys would, would probably never say it that way either because they wouldn't want any anybody to to even, you know, in any way think that they were trying to make an excuse about, you know, why something didn't go well or, or didn't perform well. But it's it's the fact. All right. And, and great players can make you look like a great coach. Um, and it can cut the other way as well, too. So I'm excited to see Lynn come in and have a chance to work with this secondary because he's got a good mix, right? You've got you've got some established guys and Marlon Humphrey, Marcus Peters, uh, Jimmy Smith, obviously been around for for a long, long time with the Ravens. Uh, you've got Deshaun Elliott, second full year as a starter. He's, he's been on the on the team for, I guess, three years now, three or four. But I know he, he missed, you know, that that first, maybe even the second year with injury. So you got Chuck Clark, uh, who's still relatively young at safety. And then you've got a whole slew of guys, right, kind of the next in line there, whether it's Anthony Averitt or – uh, Amon Biggie Marshall coming off of injury or um, Khalil Dorsey, uh, you know, the guys they drafted this year in Brandon Stevens and Sean Wade. And you've got CoCap, Anthony Levine is in there. You've got Geno Stone at safety. Um, I'm probably leaving out even more DBs. I want to say there's like, like 12 or 13 of them, I think, on the roster right now. So uh, our Darius Washington, undrafted free agent they signed out of TCU. So you've got all of these guys, right, uh, who are going to be fighting for those last couple of spots because we kind of know who the lead dogs are. Um, but we know there are always injuries that happen, uh, particularly at that cornerback position. And so you're only one play away, right, when people say, well, wait a minute, what do you need all these guys for? They're always taking cornerbacks. Why are they drafting all these cornerbacks? You don't have to go any further than 2019 and Tony Jefferson or even 2020, Jimmy Smith, but either one. 2019, Tony Jefferson getting hurt in that first Steelers game, and now Chuck Clark's a starter, right, and has been one since then. So it's one play away from any of these guys. So uh, he's going to have uh, a, a good mix of veterans and young guys to coach up and to work with and develop, and that is one part of the roster that I'm really interested in seeing how it plays out because of that competition they have for kind of those uh, – you know, that I'd say down to the, I mentioned Tavon, I forgot to mention Tavon Young coming back from injury, but I'd say in that sixth, seventh, eighth, maybe even up to ninth defensive back role, you know, spots, those are going to be up for grabs. You know, I don't, I don't know that they're, that you could say any of those are solidified. You could probably look at one through four, maybe even one through five and say, yeah, I think I kind of know who those guys are. But after that, you know, it's, it's going to be all about competition. So going to be exciting to see how that plays out and we, and we know the the amount of pressure that goes on the the secondary in this scheme like when you're using uh you know a simulated scheme that a simulated pressure scheme that you know tries to use blitzes to open up free rushes that puts extreme pressure on your db so it's something to keep an eye on and it's it's one of those things i, I came away and i was you know i came away like i was like i'm not impressed by this guy but you know, I, I you got to trust the, the the head coach and the defensive coordinator in charge. Like they saw something in Lynn, and it wasn't just you know something random, and it had nothing to do with any connections with Anthony Lynn. At least there weren't any I could find. So I, I'm excited to see what he can do and uh, see how they can develop because uh, he 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 does. He really has a lot of key pieces to work with. Like Brandon Stevens is raw in the sense that. Uh, you know, he just kind of started playing cornerback and, you know, he got himself drafted in the third round and even Sean Wade, he's oozing with potential as a, as a, you know, a nickel corner or a, you know, a dime specialist, that type of role. So it's going to be very exciting. Um, but overall, I, I think, you know, I don't, I don't say I dive into coaches too often when we make additions, but I can't remember a year where we made this many changes. And I think it was just a fact that, you know, a lot of guys got hired away. David Cully got hired away and that took two roles with him. And, you know, we saw a couple of defensive coaches go to, uh, go to, you know, prominent college football roles and, and also some, some upgrades there for them. So, you know, they, they really did a nice job of kind of, uh, I don't want to say rebounding, but it's kind of rebounding and, and bringing in some, 
really good coaches to kind of work with this young roster. Cause you know, when you look around, um, you know, the defensive line isn't overly young. It's probably our oldest unit, but you know, a lot of these new, co new coaches that are brought in are working with young units. We have a lot of young DBs. we got a lot, a lot of young linebackers, young wide receivers. So it's, I think it's exciting times to, to really, it's something that I know I'm going to be keeping a bigger pulse on this year as we see, uh, see guys develop and we see, you know, the schemes develop. Yeah, I think they lost eight coaches. I want to say that was the number, seven or eight. And none of these guys were fired. I mean, they were all hired away for promotions or other positions. So, uh, you know, that's it's, it's a gift and a curse, right? I mean, you, you lose good coaches, and that part is disappointing, but it probably also means that you've developed good coaches, right? And I think that's one thing you can, you can look at John Harbaugh over his tenure, and, and people will talk about, uh, the loyalty that he has to certain guys, we, you know, we we touched all of, on on all of that at the top with the relationship, so we understand why that happens. But he gives guys those opportunities, and then when they get in, like we also mentioned, he's going to let you do different things. He's going to encourage you to do different things uh, because he's trying to get these guys to be as well rounded as possible. At least that's my it's my impression of it. Is like he tries to develop guys so that they can be extremely well rounded, so that they can be versatile, and so when that opportunity comes they'll be better positioned to take that opportunity because uh, again, the more you can do, right. They haven't just been pigeonholed into coaching one position and doing one, one, one type of thing. So I think he's very mindful of that. I think as a, as a CEO type of coach, a lot of people will kind of give him that label, even though, I mean, look, looking at some of this stuff, I looked into some of his background, even though I knew we weren't really going to dig and go down that road with him, but he, people say, ah, oh, he was just a special teams coach. Now go go back throughout his career and look at college. He's coached a bunch of different positions. And some might be surprised to know that when he first started coaching, he was coaching uh, under Sid Gilman. So people might know Sid Gilman, kind of the father of the modern passing game. And you think, oh, this guy, all he wants to do is run the ball and play defense. I mean, look, this guy probably learned uh, passing game concepts from one of the greatest passing game minds in the history of the game. So don't, don't sleep on John Harbaugh either. Uh, you know, this is a guy is a good coach who's done a bunch of different things himself. And I think he, you know, because he's had that experience, he carries that forward, right? He learned the value of coaching all those different roles and coaching all those different positions and particularly special teams, because what other position coach uh, is going to talk to all the different position groups on the team? I mean, they get to talk to everybody on offense and defense, right? In the special teams room. So, people sometimes kind of downplay that special teams coach or special teams uh, coordinator position. But to me, that's a great entry level into possibly, a, you know, a, a get you on the path towards being a head coach because you've got to command not only a room of men, right? That's going to happen any, any group that you're in, uh, particularly at the coordinator level, but you're talking to everybody on the team, all positions. So you got to understand how to work with offensive guys. You understand work with defensive guys. You're working typically with a lot of younger guys, right? Because where do most rookies kind of start off on special teams? So uh, I think he learned a lot through all those experiences. And he, like I said, he carries that forward in how he constructs his staffs now and the kind of people he looks for. I think that's bang on. And I, I you know, we are a, uh, we're a pro special teams podcast and we're also a pro run the football podcast. So there'll be no slander of that happening on this show. Uh, but no, I, I, that's one of those things, you know, it, it's, it hits Harbaugh as you're right. It's a, it's a label that he gets. And I've referred to it several times. Cause I think it, I think it does explain his, his coaching, uh, style uh but some people see it as some sort of negative but you know in in my experience both playing and coaching um and you know following the game like i i see nothing wrong with that approach i think it can really enable guys to to do some great things in their own coaching careers and that's one thing that uh we've seen from harbaugh he does not block his coaches he, he they're open for they're open for interviews and you know, it, it goes with our own jobs, like in our own careers, we want to work for someone that supports us, supports our, our, our own career growth. And, you know, that type of reputation sticks with Harbaugh. And that's why he's going to get guys like Rob Ryan coming in that, you know, have been around and, you know, Rob Ryan has a, you know, a little black book with every coach in the NFL. He could be reaching out about any job and, you know, it, it speaks to that type of reputation. And uh, I, I think that's critical. Um, so do, do you have anything else to add on this or do we want to wrap this up? I think we can wrap it. We've, we've covered everything that I had and uh, you know, there, there certainly will be 
many more episodes to come on a variety of different topics. So uh, just feels good to get this first one uh, done and, and, you know, get it out there for the people. And, and I'm looking forward to all the other stuff. I mean, if people, if people had any idea about the, the number of things we've talked about <laughs> over the last couple of years that we wanted to do, and I'm not saying we're going to be able to do them all. I don't know, but just seeing this first step, you know, towards, all right, we're doing this and we're just going to start to kind of see how many of those ideas and how many of those things that we discuss we can share with people. So that's super exciting for me. Yeah, I, I am excited. Like th this is a lot of fun, uh, you know, I, and just so you guys know that are that are watching, you know, we're listening. We're listening to your feedback. The first thing I got hit with was you guys need some graphics. Well, check it out. We got we got some cool looking graphics and, you know, I, I know it, it, it all matters. And so this is the type of stuff we're listening to. You guys will see on my Twitter, I dropped a poll about, uh, you know, Mike and I have been talking for years about doing a uh, like a, a Ravens 101 series where we kind of break down the scheme and the different concepts that they use. So, you know, we're going to be doing something like that in more of a, a clinic. You know, if you watch a coach's clinic and they kind of use PowerPoint, run through different concepts, show plays, show what it looks like in the playbook, because we do have uh, a copy of Greg Roman's playbook from 2014, if I have it right, Mike, when he was with the 49ers. Yeah. So, um, you know, the plays aren't the exact same, but, you know, if you look at a playbook that, you'll you'll see what we mean in terms of it. it shows you a lot and so that's something i know you've been doing mike you go back through that playbook when when you watch the tape and you you match plays that he ran back in 2014 with what the ravens are doing now and so i think we can have to have a lot of fun with that project uh so you know we're always listening we're we're here to serve you guys like you know a lot of this is coming from us just shooting the shit and us wanting to put stuff out there for you guys but uh you know, if you guys have have something you want to hear about, if there's something you want to learn more about, you know, that's what we want to do too. So, uh, you know, it's all about getting to know you guys. You guys get to know us and, you know, we're going to have a lot of fun with it. So, you know, that's going to wrap up episode one. Uh, thank you guys so much for the continued support. The, it's been such a, you know, a, a motivating week for me. I, I don't know about you, Mike, but it, it was just awesome to, you know, see the positive feedback. People get excited about this and, uh, you know, that's all I got. You got anything else, Mike? No, hey, you know, we appreciate everything. We, we we saw all of the feedback, like Cole said. We've seen people tapping into the YouTube channel, subscribing, liking, commenting. So, you know, we appreciate we appreciate all that. And uh I'm just humbled, really. I, I it's the only other way I can I can explain it. I'm humbled by all of the positive responses. And um we're just on this journey together, man. You know, I say that all the time when you and I talk or with any of the people in our, our kind of little Twitter chat group talk about we're we're on this, we're on this road together and we're learning together. It's not a one-way street. This is a two-way street. So, um, you know, you can, you guys can can teach us just as much as, as we hope to be able to share some things with you. So that's all I got, man. Awesome. Well, all right. Thanks, everyone. Be good to each other. Be good to yourselves. Peace out.